Hello and welcome back, merchant princes and noble ladies of the YouTubes, to another episode of Warhammer Lore with me, Grey Hunter. As promised in the last episode, this one is going to be about the smaller nations of men. Um, it did take a long time to get done, and there's not really an excuse for that. Mainly, the last book of The End Times was released and really, really depressed me. So I had to rewrite some of this stuff, and I just couldn't be bothered for a little bit there. They ruined some of the greatest stuff about my hobby, and it made me sad. But enough about that. Um, small caveat as well, because these factions are so short on lore, this video may possibly be shorter than usual, I'm not sure entirely. There was a fair bit on Talaya and such. The lore they do have, though, very, very cool. Um, Talaya, as the home of the Dogs of War, has the most lore, but Araby and Astalia and Kislev have a little bit as well. So we'll go over pretty much everybody who has even the smallest snippet of lore. So because this is a bunch of nations, I'll be doing this particular video a little bit differently to the way I usually do them. Each nation will get an individual little section with a title card, and then Talaya will have a bit more depth, and then all the special characters for everybody at the end, because there's not all that many of them. But anyway, enough waffle, let's get on with it. So first up is Araby. If you think Arabian Nights with magic, you're not that far off of the mark. They've even got the genies in bottles and wizards riding flying carpets thing down. Ruled by a sultan from the city of Lashik, their big thing is to sail the seas like the pirates of the Barbary Coast. But they don't just do that. They're a major trading power too, selling all kinds of exotic items like spices and silks, and they've got, you know, all sorts of stuff that people want. Think Western ideas of the medieval East. You're kind of on the right track. In their early history, they fought Arkan the Black, and he reduced them to barely a few cities, so the Arabians have a burning hatred for the undead in general, but the Tomb Kings in particular, because those guys are dicks. As well as I mentioned in the Bretonia video, they did go on a bit of a rampage in the Old World during their history, launching an invasion of Astalia, and starting the Bretonians off on their crusading adventures. They don't really have all that much lore in the end, uh, they were just kind of included, and I'm not really sure why, I guess just because. <laughs> it was the 80s. They wanted to include things. Uh, in the end times, they're done for. The Skaven overran them and murderized a lot of them. So, good job there, Games Workshop, killing off all the minorities one by one. Estalia is pretty much Spain in almost every single way, from the inclusion of conquistadors going to the New World and the multiple kingdoms in the land, scheming against each other like Castile and Aragon did in our history. North of Araby, they bordered the southwest of Bretonia, so they're not actually on the same continent as Araby. They're separated by a small strait, kind of like the Strait of Gibraltar. They do have a bit of stuff in common with the Bretonians, though. They like knights. And when it comes to their honour, they're even touchier than the Bretonians are. They've been known to challenge people to duels to their death for mistaking them for their Tilean brethren. Which you might think to yourself, well, that confusion is understandable, considering they come from the exact same place in the Blighted Marshes. So they've got the exact same founding myth as the Tilaeans do, with the exception that they went west instead of east when it came to deciding where to go. Settling in the lands across the Abasco Mountains, they built large cities encircled by firm stone walls, protected somewhat by the mountains from the hordes of Skaven. They prospered in their many kingdoms until the Arabian invasions came along, though they did beat them back in the end with the help of the Bretonians and the Imperials. The Astalians believed their faith in the warrior goddess Mimirdia was paramount in the success of the reconquest of their land, and so they became kind of fanatical about it in the same fashion as the Bretonians are fanatical about the Lady of the Lake. And when Lostria was discovered, they carried their religion there in the form of conquistadors, which sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Once more, these guys don't really have all that much in the way of lore, except for their inclusion in the side stories of other factions, and like Araby, they've finally been overrun by the Skaven, though some survivors did escape to Bretonia. Albion, quite obviously an homage to Britain itself, what with the name and all, and, well, the map kind of says everything that needs to be said about that. Off of the coast of Norska, they're kind of a forgotten realm lost in the mists of time and eternal rain. They've got their own standing stone circles, part of a network that keeps the winds of magic from getting too uppity, and the place is home to both druids and giants. It's pretty much Celtic Britain on speed. They only have one unit to their name, a Dogs of War regiment, that's two giants and a druid, and they've never really done all that much except be a punching bag for Krokgar, who invaded them just before the last great war against Chaos starts. In the end times, they haven't really been featured, so basically you can just write them off as killed by chaos, like almost everything else. The Kingdoms of Ind! They basically only exist as a placeholder for an obvious India clone. Beastmen, some of whom look like tigers and skaven infest the place, and when the end times come along, they just basically gang up and destroy it. The Empire of Cathay. It's ruled by a fellow called the Immortal Dragon Emperor. Whether or not he's actually immortal is kind of up in the air. Though, as I mentioned in my general overview video, it's possible that he's a vampire, as one of the sons of the Emperor has 
visited Neferata in Lamia when she was experimenting with the whole vampire thing back in the day. They've tussled with the ogres, getting annoyed that they were eating Cathayans and calling down a goddamn common on their asses. but apart from that, they don't really do all that much. A few Talaeans do the whole Marco Polo thing and visit the Far East, opening up trade routes. And the Silk Road trade route actually runs through the Ogre Kingdom, so that must be a little bit awkward. They're rather advanced, with terracotta armies that are actually automatons capable of fighting for them, though they do have a flesh and blood army. In the end times, pretty much everything goes bad for them. The Chaos Dwarves, Chaos in general, and the Greenskins bash down their door. The Skaven had a bit of a go, but the Dragon Emperor wasn't having any of that shit, and he led his guys down into the Warrens to kill them. Unfortunately for him, his success against them meant that everybody else pretty much had free reign to invade, and Grimgor Ironhide and his army of greenskins is victorious against the Chaos Dwarves and takes Wei Jin, which is the capital, leading the Emperor to call for an evacuation like Mazda Mundi did on a fleet of ships. Not spaceships though, only the space lizards get spaceships. Nippon, the token Japanese clone, because of course they are. These guys are characterized really only by their appearance in the Genevieve novels and teaching Clan Eshin how to be sneaky ninja rats, because they totally needed help with that, didn't they? In the end times, Grimgor Ironhide invades them by accident, chasing after the Dragon Emperor's evac fleet and ends up in Nippon instead. They get their faces stomped before Grimgor Ironhide heads back west to crack more heads together, because Orcs is the biggest and the strongest. The Border Princes. These guys set up their own little realms in the mountains between the southern border of the Empire and the Badlands infested by Orcs, Goblins, and all other manner of bad griblies. Mainly mercenaries, a lot of the Dogs of War are employed by these guys to protect their little realm areas. They fight a constant battle for survival, which is saying a lot in a fantasy universe where desperate fights against the odds are pretty much the normality. In the end times, they get swarmed and most of the Border Princes end up getting killed, though some of them do side with Manfred von Karstein when he comes along in their lands hunting. Special things that we'll talk about in a different video. So some of them are now vampires. Kislev. These guys used to be an allied army for the Empire. They even had their own little army book for a little while that was kind of a supplement thing. A little bit low on lore, but had bear cavalry, and bear cavalry is always cool. Living to the north of the Empire in a land that's dominated by ice and snow and separated from the chaos wasteland by what's known as troll country, because that's not ominous at all. Uh, Kislev is basically a stepping stone to the Empire or a stepping stone to the chaos wastes, depending on who's invading who at the time. Ruled by Tsarina Katarina the Ice Queen, who wields powerful magic, usually in the form of ice. She's a frosty lady. Hoi hoi. They're, uh, they're a hardy folk. They're Fairly tough, considering that they live sandwiched between two massive people who are trying to kill one another. In the end times, they kind of have a last stand hurrah thing, and the Von Karstein vampires of all people come to fight alongside them in a sort of glorious last stand. And now we're on to what's probably going to be the meat of the video, Talea. These fellows are the largest of the smallest nations of men in terms of lore, if not geographical size. Uh, their origin myth talks about a city in the Blighted Marshes, which is quite likely the same city as the Skaven founding myth has. Uh, the Talaeans and what would become the Astalians head off in different directions when they all leave the Blighted Marshes, and the Talaeans end up in, um, well, Talea, where there's a ton of elven settlements that are ruined from before the War of the Beard. Settling there, they struck up trade with the elves who hadn't quite abandoned the area entirely at that point, and the various city-states were born, so Talea is not one united country, it's basically Italy during the city-state period. A mix of aristocracies, republics, theocracies, and all manners of other governments, Talea's city-states are, well, as I said, the Italian ones of our history, transplanted. And they're constantly sniping at each other and locked in struggles for dominance, not just between each other, but even in their own cities. Isolated from a lot of the troubles that the Empire and Bretonia faced with the Greenskins by the mountains to their north, and the dwarven fortresses that happen to be in them, as well as their tendency to hire mercenaries rather than fight themselves, the Talaeans ended up with a culture that was more inclined towards pursuits like science, art, exploration, and astronomy. Each of the city-states has a rich and colourful bit of lore attached to it, so we'll go over a few of the more interesting ones before we move on to special characters. The Principality of Tabaro, the only Talaean city on the western coast of the Talaean Sea, and therefore closest to Estalia. Tabaro was once an elven outpost, and commanded the seas with an excellent port. Attacked many times by their Astalian brethren and by the Sultan of Araby when he went on that whole attack Astalia and take over Talea thing, the city has become a pretty much coastal fortress. The sea and the land were not the only places an enemy could attack them from, however. Under the city itself ran a maze of catacombs from back when the elves held it, and the Skaven were quick to utilize them when they attacked the city, driving out the reigning prince. However, he was to return and kill off the Skaven, walling up the catacombs so they couldn't go through them again, and stationing a permanent force of mercenaries to watch for signs of tunnelling. Not all has been well and rosy for Tabaro, though. They hold the distinction of electing a pig to the princedom, named Pigolo I, 
and he ruled for 12 years until he died while inspecting the guard, toppling off the battlements. The mighty principality of Mirogiliano. A city that was built close to the blighted marshes, the Mirogiliano has fought the Skaven pretty much since its inception. Being so close to the marshes has led to a danger from plague, and the city was amongst those hit hardest by the Red Pox when the Skaven clans released it into the world. Due to its location, basically near the marshes but also near the sea, the city is crisscrossed by canals, and the populace uses them as if they were normal streets to get in and out of the city and to cross it back and forth. These canals have been used by the Skaven before to infiltrate, so now they boast gates like a fortresses sealed by massive portcullises. Located near the mountain passes leading to the Empire of Bretonia, Mirajiliano puts a heavy emphasis on learning how to fight more effectively and better than their potential foes. Combined with the need to combat illness, the city focuses heavily on sciences and inventions, being home to many famous inventors and scientists, surprise surprise, like Leonardo di Mirajiliano. The Republic of Remus. Like Tabaro, Remus was built on the ruins of old elven settlements, this one boasting a harbour like the one of ancient Carthage that houses a large merchant fleet. It is on the economic strength of this merchant fleet, and the strength of the legions of heavy pikemen that the city fields, that has kept Remus strong and independent. Invaded many times, including by the Dark Elves on more than one occasion, the Republic harbours a deep loathing for the inhabitants of Nagaroth, and are known to provide their mercenary services to people at war with them for a discount price. Ruled by a council of three triumvirs, the city has a relatively stable form of government, though it has known periods of civil war when one or two of the triumvirs gang up on their colleagues and try to take over the city, though more often than not these prospective tyrants end up dead on the senate floor with knives in their bodies. The ancient principality of Lucini. At the southernmost tip of Talea, Lucini is first and foremost a naval power, having honed the skills of their navy on the pirate lords of Sartosa, though it is well known for the quality of its generals as well. Founded by the twins Lucan and Lucina atop a ruined elven acropolis, the city prospered due to an excellent trading position. The twins became venerated as gods, and the city was named for Lucina, and a temple was raised on the acropolis to the divine twins. Of course, this wouldn't be Talea without some problems to go along with this. The princes of the city claim descent from one or the other of the twins, and this leads to a great deal of infighting, the command of the city passing from one of the dynasties to the other, until Lorenzo Lupo came to power, claiming descent from both in more recent times. The mighty fortress of Monte Castello. A fortress built upon the ruins of a dwarven fortress, built upon the ruins of an elven fortress before it, Monte Castello is an impregnable fortification, having never fallen to the enemy. Guarding the eastern marches from orc incursions, Monte Castello has been fought over so many times as to be uncountable, with all the cities of Talea putting in funds to garrison it, given its strategically commanding position. The closest it ever came to falling was when 500 mercenaries were besieged by more than 100,000 orcs for almost a year. Old Galeazzo commanded the garrison, but he was mortally wounded repelling the orcs from the wall. Luckily for the defenders, his daughter, Mona Lisa, they dug real deep for that one, didn't they, was stout of heart and she put on his armour, leading the charge so the men would think the old war horse still lived. Losing her helm in one of the attacks, the men became disheartened when they realised Galileazzo was actually dead and decided to try and make a run for it, but Mona Lisa appealed to their sense of pride in Talea and craftsmanship, for a great fresco, lauded as the best in Talea, was hung in the commander's quarters, and the survivors pledged to defend it, holding out until help arrived. Mona Lisa didn't actually live to see it, though, being killed by an orcish arrow as the relief force came over the horizon, but she was immortalised in many paintings. The decadent pirate principality of Sartosa. Built on an island south of Lucini, the original city was destroyed by the Dark Elves and the Tomb Kings under Cetra the Imperishable. Eventually Norsemen from the Chaos Waste took up residence, using it as a base to raid until the Talaeans defeated them in a great sea battle, hiring the survivors to garrison the island and protect it against more raiders like themselves. Unfortunately for them, the Corsairs of Araby conquered the island, until Prince Luciano of Lucini drove them out, once more hiring the surviving Corsairs to defend the island. Becoming a strong naval base for Lucini, the mercenaries eventually tired of this service and rebelled, beginning their own series of raids on the Talaean coastline and electing from their number a pirate prince or princess. Now the city is a den of scum and villainy sailing the waves and sinking ships. You are a pirate. So special characters, those important people in a sea of normality. Most of these guys don't actually have any end times lore, either they're already dead or they've been pretty much forgotten about by Games Workshop due to how niche they are, so a lot of these people won't necessarily be relevant to a Warhammer Total War, but they are interesting. Borgio the Besieger. The Prince of Mirajiliano and a renowned soldier, Borgio gained his reputation from being an excellent tactician, defeating his enemies in the field so handily that they decided it was clearly safer to fight him from behind walls. 
Not so much. Borgio turned out to be just as good at that. A fearsome figure, he carries a mace that was made out of a cannonball that once failed to kill him, and he wears armour made out of melted down statues from the blighted marshes that stopped the cannonball. He's had a rather storied career, having fought against all the other Talaian states, including the pirates of Sartosa, who he was captured by. Escaping by leaping out of the tower he was being kept in into the sea, he swam back to the coast of mainland Talaia and returned to the island with a fleet, capturing the pirate princess of Sartosa exchanging her for a large treasury from the other pirates. Unfortunately for Borgio, all the regiments of renown in his army and all his military skill couldn't save him from assassination in the bath with a poisoned toasting fork. Leonardo di Merigliano, a famous inventor who created many marvellous machines and served many patrons, including famous mercenary generals, the Prince of Merigliano at the time, and even the Emperor. In the service of the Emperor, he started the Imperial Engineering School, and he had the opportunity to create some of his more famous inventions, including the steam tank, though the secrets of its working was lost when he died. His death was also to do with his inventions when he was testing his heavier-than-air flying machine that was powered by alcohol, and he plowed it into the engineering school, destroying part of the campus when it exploded, and naturally himself. As well as just being interesting in general, as a character on the tabletop, he's kind of weird, because he's not a soldier and he's not a wizard, he's a genius. He's literally labelled as being uniquely a genius. Lucrezia Belladonna a character that is clearly based off the famous perception of Lucrezia Borgia as a beautiful poisoner, this character blends a command of magic with poisonous items. Married seven times, she's suspected of killing every single one of her husbands, be it through poison or the assassin's blade. This stunningly beautiful woman's enemies never live long after they've given her offence. At a tourney, a Talian noble praised her beauty, calling her the most beautiful lady in the land, to which a Bretonian knight, who was also participating, claimed that the Lady of the Lake was obviously far more beautiful, and challenged the Talian to a duel, the duel being a joust in this case. Asking for the Lady Belladonna's favour, she kissed the lance tip of the Talian's lance, and though the Bretonian unhorsed the Talian, the knight was scratched by the lance and fell from his horse dead. You really, 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 really don't want to get on this woman's bad side. Midas the Mean, a paymaster of mercenary armies who got his start as the paymaster of the dwarf pirate Greedy Scumbeard, who failed to realise that Midas was keeping his gold safe by hiding it away from him with the intent of keeping it. Moving on to the Prince of Verezzo's service, he managed to retreat with the pay chest in a completely different direction to the prince in the army, again, keeping the gold for himself. He continues to serve as paymaster for many mercenary generals despite this reputation, but not once has he let a pay chest fall into the hands of the enemy. Then again, he's not really ever let the gold fall into the hands of his employer or their armies either. Lorenzo Lupo, the Prince of Lucini, currently alive. He claims descent from both the twin founders of the city and clings to the old traditions. Fighting on foot rather than on a horse like his contemporaries, Lorenzo stands out as a throwback to a very, very different day. His reputation as a general, however, is almost as good as Borgia the besiegers, and so he avoids the ridicule of his fellows for fighting in the front line on foot like a pleb. Carrying the ancestral sword of Lucan and the shield of Mermerdia with him, Lorenzo is the very model of an ancient Uccini warrior. Marco Colombo, famous explorer and prince of the Principality of Transio, he's the man who discovered Lustria in the year 1492 by Imperial Reckoning. Guess who he's meant to be? Although he went there to explore and perhaps conquer, Colombo ended up working as a mercenary for the Slan and returned a rich man, leading a veteran army to Trantio and making himself prince of the city, maintaining a heavy emphasis on exploration. A soldier, explorer, prince, and merchant, Marco Colombo is perhaps a paragon of Talian culture. Tsarina Katerina, the famous Ice Queen of Kislev. She commands powerful ice magic and is regarded by some Kislevites as the reincarnation of the first Queen of Kislev and a warrior witch. Though she frequently leads from the rear, she does not fear combat, and has fought many times against the tribes of the north with her armies and that of the Empire. In the end times, she rides to battle one last time beside the von Karstein vampires, though her death was never actually confirmed as far as I could find, it was just kind of alluded to. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the smaller nations of men in a nutshell. Given that the end times ends with a great tussle for Sigmar's Warhammer, which was really, really shit, by the way, I really, 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 really hope they don't go with the end times for Warhammer Total War, because that's totally not going to fly with me. No, not even once. Because my opinion is totally the thing that's going to make CA change their mind. If these factions do turn up, it'll likely not be as playable folks, but to augment mercenary forces like the Dog of War. Which is okay, because they don't really have a ton of lore, and they don't really have a ton in the way of army units, but this means that they get to include the flavour without having to create entirely new background material for existing things that they want to do such as mercenaries. 
Anywho, that brings us to the end of the video, and next time we will be looking at the vampire counts, those devious little blood suckers. So thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next lore video with me, Greyhunter.